history of uh, the Journal of Premium Production, which you can see here. There are some uh, examples. I'm sure he'll I'll tell you more, more uh, about that himself. So, uh, uh, welcome everyone, and I'll, I think I'll leave the floor. Uh, let uh, let's break the ice a little bit, on that because I don't know who's who. Let's start with uh, Professor Glavitt, please. You can introduce yourself in very short, short time so that we can all get to know exactly what we do, who we are, and things like that. So. You <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ilyanka Brezlova. I'm an associate professor in ecology and environmental protection at the University of Forestry in Sofia, Bulgaria. And I'm teaching biodiversity protection, protective fairness, and sustainable and I'm attending the meeting of, <laughs> of the project of uh, educators for sustainable. Now, my name is Peter Glavic. I'm at the University from Mar of Maribor, Slovenia, where I am a, a professor in uh, chemical engineering and sustainable development. And I'm also attending the, the project meeting. Uh, my name is Elena Dimitrova, I come from Sofia, University of Architecture, Studio Engineering and Geodesy. I'm teaching, uh, I'm an architect, and I'm teaching at the a new program of urbanism. I teach sustainability, I teach uh, urban theory, uh, European planning systems, and contemporary urban policies for sustainable development. And, uh, well, I'm involved in some research as well. I'm interested in the local level, and I want to learn more about the rules of publishing uh, in academic journals. And that's it. I'm also a participant in the project of University Educators for Sustainable Development. Please. I'm Katarzyna Wojtowa, and I'm an editor in Karolini Press. I am Jan Havlíček, and I am also editor of the uh, academic journals of Charles University in Prague uh, in Karolina. My name is Peter Gott, and I'm the colleague of, of my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I, I shall also introduce myself. I am Jana Dlouha. I have, uh, together with my colleagues, planned for this workshop so that there are two groups meeting together, uh, people from uh, East European countries, which uh, were here in the morning for the project meeting, and uh, editors for journals uh, of Charles University, which are coming just now. So I hope to have a productive, really productive meeting today. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, it's good to see all the different editors of so many different journals and disciplines together. And I can assure you, we all face the same problem. How many papers do you get per year? Uh, how do we review all of those things? Uh, I'm going to talk about my role, my new role as associate editor of the Journal of Theater Production, which has been my, my career here has been uh, first as an author, then as a reviewer, then as a special volume editor, special editor, special volume editor, then a subject editor, now as associate editor, and the description going to go increasing and increasing. First question, when did you start publishing? How did you publish? And why did you publish? Have you ever asked yourself those questions as editors? Any ideas? By the way, I don't want this to be a one-way presentation, okay? Prefer it if we can do it a two-way, three-way, twenty-way. Uh, any ideas? Egypt. Egypt? How, how many years ago? Four, five thousand. Oh, a few <laughs> thousand years before that. Yes in the French caves and in all the different caves. Why do we publish? Because we want to communicate something. Yeah, perhaps it's painting, you know. Painting. Yes, but by the way, that was not peer reviewed. <laughs> it was a little bit difficult to chop the, the rocks and send them to your, to your colleagues in, in Spain and say, oh, please, please peer review my paintings. Uh, Alves and uh, Georgie, I think it was from Gary, so now have to find out because then we have to be from Gary. He said that discovery consists in looking at the same thing from a different perspective, a new way of looking at things. Yeah, I think we might need to get rid of this kind of Just keep some talking. I'm talking on behalf of Elsevier, which is a little bit of a competitor to, to your publishing house. We are receiving 3 million articles per year, 1.5 being published. We have 30 million readers, 2 billion digital downloads, and 30 million article citations. A lot of papers a year. And these are the submissions to Elsevier, I think 2012. You can see China is on the, on the rise, uh, the US, Iran is also growing, uh, Europe is also a large part, the UK has been important. Now we're talking about quantity, we're not talking about quality. Quality is slightly different, and then that depends on which subject we are talking about. I'll be more than willing to make this presentation available to you, or give it to Jana, and she can send it to you. Um, these are the ones from Elsevier, the, the increase. Uh, the U China has been increasing a lot, the US, uh, the Czech Republic doesn't really appear with that yet. Uh, these are the articles accepted from the US, it has decreased, decreased a little bit, and from China it's increased a little bit. But if you check, the ones submitted by China and the ones accepted by China are still a uh, big difference. In, in the Journal of Production, we've seen a huge rise in Chinese papers. The quality has not, uh, average quality has not improved because we're getting more papers, but we're getting some really good papers and some really bad papers. We're getting more and more and more. That's a particular case of the Journal of Production. China, we, we see in the rise. Spain is very important. Brazil, the US. Uh, I should say that the Journal of Media Production, I don't know how many of you have consulted this one, downloaded any papers from that one? No? 
It's one of the most transdisciplinary journals on sustainability. If you've never had a chance, please have a look at it. Uh, I'll pass them around in a little bit. Uh, again, the same comparison, but for just for the journal. China going up, Brazil going up, Spain has gone down a little bit. But as you can see, there are lots of papers that we're getting. Uh, a few years ago, uh, let me think, that was three years ago, we received 500 manuscripts. In there. Then we received, next year, 1,100 manuscripts. Last year we got 2,136 manuscripts. Today, the last paper I edited was number 355. And we're in the middle of February. So we're getting a lot of paper. Also, our impact factor has gone from 1.2 to 1.7 to 2.2 to 2.7 to 3.4 almost. So hoping this year will go up again. So what is it that publishers do? And the people from the government policy can tell me what you do. You register, you certify, you disseminate, and you preserve the information that is being done. I, I was lucky to go to the Elsevier offices in Amsterdam a few months ago, and you can see all the amazing books that they have, the very ancient 300, 400 year books. It's really nice. Of course, we don't forget those, not that quality anymore. But more people are reading. Uh, that was established by the Royal Society of the Netherlands many, many years ago, still valid today. Of course, the means are different. We don't have the Gutenberg press anymore. We have the internet press now. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, everybody's familiar with this cycle. Yeah? We solicit and manage submissions. Some journals have to solicit uh, from the authors. In the particular case of the Journal of Clean Production, we don't really need to do that, except for special volumes. Manage a peer review, edit uh, the paper, and so on, and go through the list. Uh, we all know that peer review, we want to check the quality, we want to check the great edition, we want to check some other things. And we're moving more and more towards an electronic approach. In the Journal of Clean Production, the first two papers I sent, you have to put them on a word file, send them to the editor, and the editor will deal with them. Twenty years ago, you had to type them on, a, on the typewriter, send them to the editor, hope the, the postman doesn't lose them, and you have to send two copies or three copies because then they have to send them to the different authors, uh, sorry, reviewers, and then the reviewers mark the comments, come back to the editor. That will take a long time. Now the peer review is extremely quick. Elsevier. It's forcing us to have peer reviews done in 21 days. It went from one month to 28 days to now 21 days. My reviewers have. We're asking the reviewers in the journal of clean production we need minimum three reviewers. That means that I have to ask for six reviewers because usually half of them decline to review. But if we have 2,000 manuscripts submitted, I have to invite over 12,000. Um, Reviewers, yeah, of course, I'm counting very light. Some reviewers review two or three ten papers. We edit those ones on the, the author submits the manuscript, the um, also we are pre printed, you get a paper accepted, um, then you send it back to the author with the proofs, the author checks that everything's right, and you do the, the, the proofing. You have get the corrected proof, then you put the logo, the pagination, and all those things, and then you put it into a nice volume like this. Or like this, but Jan yeah, edited. But we're seeing the decline of these ones. How many of you, when you're doing research, go to the library and pick up one of these? Nobody. That's if you don't want to print this or something. Nobody really wants to print this much. They are very expensive, they take a long time. Actually, I do go to the library because I do research in history of the time. <laughs> yes. That's historical, yeah? But the publishers, they don't want to publish this. They are expensive, it takes a long time. But you can, you can only do uh, two-dimensional printing here. On the internet, you can put videos. You can put some type of Google Maps, and I will see you later. Of course, you have to publish and disseminate. Some of the traditional print journals include uh, uh, stem cell, 
environmental management, the Journal of Clean Production, uh, Waste Management, The Lancet, which is uh, somewhere between the newsletter and the journal, Resources Conservation and Recycling, and then we also have the new electronic journals like the, uh, I always get worse confused, and the Gogeka. Yes. And some other ones that are an only online base. Some of them are getting postcards and, and, and blogs. Have, has anybody of you who has a smartphone downloaded the Cybers app? No? Have it here my, on my iPhone. You download it, it gives you uh, news about the journals that you want, about the page, the, the authors that you want, about the topics that you want on your iPhone. Ah, tick, tick, tick. You get it immediately. And then you can download the PDF, you can read the PDF on your, on your phone. Of course, you have to archive and promote the use. Uh, we are trying to partner to have multiple ways of archiving and doing these things. Um, for example, with the National Library of the Netherlands and organizations like that. Uh, you also have, for example, Google Books and that have been doing something like that. So we're moving towards a more electronic way of doing things online and, and publishing. How do we improve the science and the health of our communities? Or how to publish it? By making access easy. Okay, most of the articles that are being done by publishers, especially for example Elsevier, they are research articles. They're being accessed. Uh, the access to those articles is 97% in North America, 94 in Europe. The lowest one is in Africa, 78, but you can see there's a lot of possibilities of access. Elsevier is offering now to developing countries free access to the job, most of the journals. They don't really have an, uh, open access to everybody yet, but they are doing that for philanthropic reasons. And we can question that at another point. Uh, you want to improve productivity? Uh, how much time do I spend reading and analyzing research articles within the last five years? Um, uh, there's been a significant difference from those three. So people are reading more in that sense. Because we, sometimes because we have more better access. Uh, also because the uh, style is changing. Uh, sorry. How many of you feel the pressure as authors from your university to publish, 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 publish? How many don't? <laughs> How many of you feel that it now is worse than five years ago? Practically everybody. Universities are going down the line of assistant professor, one to two papers a year, associate professor, five to six, professor, 25, or more. Uh, not single author, of course, but yeah. you don't do it, you don't get promoted, you don't get a professorship, you don't get paid, you get more classes. They're driving us crazy as authors, as reviewers, and as editors. There's been an expansion of scientific research. Uh, if you take, for example, the compound uh, annual growth in the articles and the articles <coughs> in thousands, Malaysia has been publishing a lot. I don't know the reason why, but we're getting a lot of papers from Malaysia in the Journal of Introduction. Iran, although they were sanctioned by the US government, don't know if you have you heard about that? They were sanctioned by the US government that any editor who was based in the US or was American could not edit any paper from Iran that was from a government office. They could edit from universities, but not from anything else than university. That has changed because Elsevier, Springer, and Wiley put a lot of pressure and say, hey, we're talking about science. We're not talking about politics in that sense. Of course, science and politics can't separate from everything. We wish we could. I was talking about the information philanthropy. That's from Elsevier giving free access to the different journals, different articles, to people in developing countries. Uh, you have the Bora, the Ore, Kinari, um, Elsevier partners with the UN and tries to give open access to all of these ones. 
Please interrupt me if I go too fast or if I don't, uh, if I don't speak clearly or uh, if I'm too boring. Where are we at? I think we are in a transition. In a transition that nobody really knows exactly what's going to happen. Everybody wants to guess what's going to happen. We are more or less in the same time that the uh, television, uh, that the CDs started going out and saying, hey, there's not going to be any more LPs. Has anybody listened to an LP recently? Has seen an LP? Yes, they didn't disappear. These ones, I can almost assure you, they're not going to disappear. They're just going to become extremely rare and very expensive. Uh, we are moving from this to that. Uh, I think it's, it's Arabic, right? To more interactive articles to places where you can put videos of your research, where you can have interactive formulas, you could even plug in numbers over there and see what happens. You can play with those things, you can move, you can add those videos, you can add uh, drawings, which you couldn't do before. In the Journal of Introduction, now we have uh, what we call a graphical abstract. Before, we didn't have it. The maximum we would reach was color figures. And that was, that's still very expensive. Google Maps, interactive Google Maps. We are moving towards that. We are in the announced the tra the transitioning from the EES, which was the old system, to the uh, Signverse, I think it's called. They call it something strange. We are also moving to a cluster of art of journals. Before, you used to read this one, or this one, or stem cell, or the chemical engineering journal, and that was it. You would send your paper to one, to one journal, then get rejected, and then you had to send the same paper to, the, to another journal. And so it is now working on clusters. You send it to us, you will send it to the reviewer, the reviewer said, it doesn't fit the scope of this journal, but it might fit the scope of, for example, resources conservation and recycling. We are moving towards passing it completely, with reviews and everything to resources conservation and recycling and letting that editor handle that. Slowly moving towards that. I think it's still within Elsevier. I heard rumors that they wanted to do it with, within the different publishing houses. I don't know if that will work. Wait a few more years. Um, we have uh, peer-reviewed uh, innovations and peer-reviewed Again, those are really hot topics. <coughs> do we want an open peer review? Do we want everybody to contribute to that in some sort of a Wikipedia of the paper? Hmm. Do we have an article school? Do we have a reviewer's evaluation? We have some of those. Um, sadly, in the genre of peer production, we don't have the luxury of grading our reviewers because we're getting so many papers that we cannot grade them. We used to do it. Right now, I can't do it. I'm receiving between three papers and sometimes even 20 papers a day. I can't play all my reviews. I keep on the top of my head who are my good reviews, how long do they take, what are the critics on, but you can't do that. This is the new platform from Elsevier, eVice. Still not active yet. We've been working on that for the last two or three years. It takes a long time. The EES system, if you've ever sent a paper to Elsevier, wasn't designed for submitting papers. It was adapted and it doesn't work out perfectly fine. But we promise that EVICE is going to work really nice. Promises and promises, but we'll wait until you see. We can read papers now on our mobile phones, on our iPads, on our computers. You can download any paper right now. You can go to Mendeley. Anybody used Mendeley before? Yeah? And not Mendeley reference, you can just download it and have your database on that. Martin, that's the science director that was mentioned in Bath. Open access. Are any of your journals open access? I know Janos one is. The other ones? 
Yes. Why? We don't generate much income anyway from sales and we make articles available immediately mm -hmm. to a large audience and they get cited earlier. So, the same reason. Uh, you don't ask your authors to pay for your article, right? But they don't pay. No. There's, that's been a hot topic again in Australia. In the whole publishing houses, they're saying, hey, but some, uh, uh, some publishers are asking their authors to pay between 200, 300, or 500 dollars beforehand without assuring that you're going to be to have your paper accepted. And sometimes the authors think, I pay, therefore my paper is going to be accepted. Some publishing houses, open access houses, have been very ethical. Uh, for example, the Journal of Sustainability, I think, I think it's MDP, a Swiss house. They are doing okay. But again, you as an author have to come up with 350 Swiss francs to pay for one paper. Hmm. Okay? A little bit complicated. So again, that's been a hot topic of, of conversation. And then you have, for example, full open access journals, green open access journals, hybrid journals, uh, for example, the Journal of Green Production. Where, if, you, if you've been given funding by the British Heart Foundation, uh, the FWF, ANCF, and sometimes the European Union, they tell you what they give you your funding. That's all the amount of money that they give you, and so many thousand uh, euros are to be spent on open access. So what you do with that money is you pay Elsevier to have your paper or papers made open access in our journal. So we run under the traditional model, but some of our, of our papers are open access. Kind of a hybrid model. And then you have the free archive from Elsevier, those are all the versions that anybody can access. Uh, okay. Those are the reasons that we publish. First of all, and that's why we keep on asking our authors to do our uh, reviews to check for. We want new and original research. We don't want research that has been done over and over and over again. But we all want that, right? We all want new research, new interesting research. We don't want the same thing again. We want to systematize the published results. We have different results, we want to make them into a system. More and more, we're getting integrated, holistic, comprehensive <coughs> reviews. In the Journal of Clinical Production, a normal article will range between six and 8,000 words. A comprehensive review can go up to 12,000 words. I just recently checked one of Stefan Sawyer, which is going to appear in the moments. It's a really good review. It tells you exactly what the method was, exactly what they counted, all the literature that they checked, everything. It's a really good review. About how it works. They're being cited a lot, more and more than many other of the other papers. Of course, publish or perish. We're all under that pressure. You publish, you, you you get the money, you publish, you run the new grant application, you get the money, you get to be this, they get the public, the papers published, and so on and so forth. And that's what is happening right now. We're all competing against each other for funds. Even though we would like to collaborate, but you know, that's the nature of the beast. We want, again, something that you already know, originality, advances in the field appropriate methods and conclusions. We were discussing in the previous session that in sustainability science we're still fairly new science, we're still developing our methods. Unlike chemical engineering, that methods have been developed for a long time. Pick up the Paris Chemical Engineering Handbook. It says handbook. It's a brick about that size. So papers are very, very thin. We want our readers to be able to understand the papers. We don't want Science to be so uncomprehensible that nobody can read. 
we want papers that meet ethical standards. A couple of German ministers have been sacked because they plagiarized an entire PhD thesis. And I've heard of other countries that have also been sacked. Yeah. We don't want duplications. This year we've had three major cases of ethical problems in the Journal of Clinical Production. Double submission. Authors who added other authors without their permission. And things like that. We're getting a lot more. Of course, we're getting a lot more papers. Those things are going to appear. Something that is not scientific. Hey, if it's not scientific, probably sit in the, what's it called, the, the Prague uh, Lancet or the Prague uh, Daily. Something that is out of date. Keep on updating your papers. Badly and poorly written methods, and I discussed the methods a little bit. Okay. Something that doesn't have sufficient data or doesn't provide the limitations of that data. Yes, we couldn't get any more data, but at least acknowledge why you couldn't get that, that data. In uh, 60 to 80 percent of the papers in this one, which still has a little bit of a natural science orientation, that's the structure. And you start with a really good title, otherwise people don't read the paper. You come up with a very, very long title, people go like, oh, boring paper. Authors and their affiliation, correct one, a good, well-written abstract in keywords. And then we have an introduction, literature review, methods, results or findings, whether they're qualitative or quantitative, discussion and conclusions. Sorry, I missed an S over there. Acknowledgements. Supplementary material, sorry, references and supplementary material. We are now able to put large databases on LCS crowds. So you add it as a supplement material. You can also add videos, you can add graphs that are too large to have a normal paper. Of course, that needs to be accurate. And each of those ones, as you are more than aware, has a particular function. Introduction provides you the background, literature review, what has been written about it, methods, what is it that we did and how we did it, limitations, what you found, how you link it to your literature review, and your conclusions, what's original and what's unique of this paper, what are the implications of this paper. I received so many papers in the journal, great introduction, great literature review, methods, well explained, Good result, uh, result, good uh, findings, good discussion, and the conclusions. Three lines. This research did that. You're like, oh, why? You've done such a great research. What does it mean? Ask your authors, so what? And you've done great research. Put it there. I promise I will give you a little bit of methodology. I hope I don't bore you too much with that. I keep on getting papers that says section 3, methodology. Practically none of the papers that we receive are philosophical papers. And when we talk about methodology in the strict sense, it's about the study of methods. Yeah? In the strict sense. Any philosophers around? No? Okay, so I'm not making any mistakes. If I'm making them, you won't notice this. <laughs> on the strict sense, it's a study of methods. Again, it depends on which journal. Some journals want you to have methodology in that section. For us, we're making it more and more strict. So either methods, research methods, methodological approach, and things like that. Uh, Saunders Lewis at uh, Thornhill proposed a very nice uh, graph to show, uh, I mean, uh, to illustratively show all the different epistemologies, ontologies, research design, approaches, uh, how many methods, and data collection and data analysis. Most of the natural sciences are around there, where you develop your hypothesis and you go on and test them. Yeah? You are doing a kind of research, right? You are around there. 
depending on your topic, depending on how you deal with it. Okay? Epistemologies are about the study of knowledge. Ontologies and the studies of being. They are different. And they're not really lines. Yesterday I had a, a workshop in Czesko Budejovice. They were asking the students, how do I choose what is what? I said, look, there are only two, there's only one line. That one. The other ones, they're, they're more like fans. Because you can do critical realism with a survey and a collection of case studies, or you can use pragmatism with actual research, <coughs> so they're more flexible over there. That one is very rigid. We've been doing natural sciences for a long time. You propose your hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, you either disprove or prove your hypothesis. Not more than that. Yeah? But I wanted to show you this because I know that there are so many different types of uh, approaches here. Always be aware, aware that there are other paradigms. Here, usually on a normal volume, we get 30-40% of such things. Yeah, uh, let's see. The effect of treatment pressure on wool fiber in supercritical carbon dioxide fluid. Sounds pretty much like that, right? Now let's see all of this. Uh, learning networks in higher education. Universities in search of making effective regional impacts. That's by Jan, by the way. That's not positivistic. That's somewhere <coughs> over there or over there. You still have to read the paper so I can tell you exactly which paradigm they're using. We have, as I said there, these are different research strategies which provide you a framework for collecting and analyzing your data. Each has advantages, each has disadvantages. How many of you have used more than one research method in your, in your papers? More than two? More than three? More than four? Am I the only one? I've gone from positivism to realism. I've done uh, t-testing uh, experiments, and NOVA testing, cluster analysis, content analysis, grounded theory, hermeneutics, so the whole part, the whole camera. Don't do it, you go a little bit back. Of course, you want to relate that to your questions or hypothesis so that you can generate valid, reliable, and credible conclusions. If you're using an experiment for pragmatism, you are not going to generate valid conclusions. I've had that in papers before. I'm doing an exploratory research and I'm doing a survey. That doesn't work. Exploratory research ends up somewhere around here. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, according to Remini uh, and his colleagues, that's where you start. First, pose a question or an objective or a hypothesis. Yeah. At the end of the day, they're all the same thing. It's just how you write it. Do you have any propositions? And if so, which are the propositions? What your unit of analysis? Is it this entire room? Is it the, the flea that uh, only bites the left ear of German shepherds? I'm just exaggerating a little bit. I don't know if fleas only bite the left one. Uh, are there any logic? Is there any logic linking the data? And finally, how can you interpret my data? In natural sciences, that's not so complicated. In social sciences, it can become really complicated, really messy. Quantitative versus qualitative, a little bit of an over, overstretching that. Quantitative just to be deductive, you test the theory. Qualitative, usually inductive, you want to develop your theory. Uh, um, quantitative usually product. Uh, usually it's um, in the natural sciences. Quantitative is usually within the interpretation. But of course you have that gray area. 
Objectivism and constructionism in the ontological approach. Research questions. Yes, we need them. If we don't create our research questions, we cannot get to where we want. We need to develop them properly. But according to the type of question that you set, that's going to lead to your proper research design. It establishes whether you're doing a qualitative or a quantitative approach. I'll try to give you a break in about 10 minutes. Would that be reasonable? Yeah. Yes, otherwise better than other people start. So we can have some coffee. If you ask the questions why and what, why is exploratory, what is explanatory. Yeah? They usually answer through quantitative research. If you ask how much, that's quantity. That's what you want to test the theory. If you want to explore the theory, you use a why and a what. First, you check what there is, and then you check how much of that there is. Anybody take it and took analytical chemistry in high school or in university? Yes? What do you do first? Do you check what is in there, or do you check how much is it in there? It depends. It depends. <laughs> it depends on your professor. If you don't know what is there, how can you know how much of it is in there? Yeah? Same applies for this. First ask what's there, and then ask how much. I've seen authors trying to ask how much without asking what's there. If somebody else has published something about it, then you can test that their hypothesis. And then you can refute their hypothesis. If nobody has ever discussed that, hey, I was giving the example, a uh, hypothetical example, on how many uh, purple turtles are there in the Galapagos Island. I was in a workshop in, in Lisbon. It's true as well, huh? First of all, are there any turtles in the Galapagos Island? Okay. Yes, there are still some. But are there any purple turtles in the Galapagos Island? Anybody? Are there any purple turtles anywhere in the world? I'm not seeing any unless you paint them. How can you ask how many Galap uh, purple turtles are there in the Galapagos Island if you don't know if there are any? Uh, they will help you, the research question of the topic, uh, guide your literature review, check what's around, what data to collect, how to collect it, how to analyze it, how to write up the data and the analysis, and finally stop you from going somewhere else. Okay? Research is really interesting, especially if you like to read. But you, you, you open any Wikipedia page and it can take you from one to the other to the other to the other to the other and then you forgot what, where you start. <laughs> That's where you have your research questions. <coughs> they are extremely challenging. You have to make them clear. You have to make them broad enough but specific enough. You have to make them reachable. Have to make them sh make sure they reach uh, they, they connect theory and research. Have to link one to the other. Do not put any assumptions there. There are lots of people who write assumptions there. We come back to the point of original and unique contribution to science. Has to be that. If somebody else has already written about that, your paper is simply not going to be published. Or we are not going to accept your paper as editors. And the reviewers are going to say, no, that's been written before. Glavich wrote about it in 2009. Lohan wrote about it in 2007. Why are you writing the same thing? Why are you reinventing the wheel? <coughs> Avoid the yes and no answers. <coughs> um, shall we have a break now? And then we will look at the research types. Yeah. Yes? Yes? No? Yes? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, is there a coffee or Yes. Uh, I think it will be a little bit. How long do you give
Yes. 